I launched Natural Selections this week. The very first post is called Fact Checkers Aren't Scientists, Too Often They're Censors. Um, and the second one, which is co-written uh, by Brett and me on driving SARS-CoV-2 extinct, why we need a multi-pronged approach. Uh, this is very, we just published this uh, yesterday evening. Um, it's very long, sometimes technical, not as much fun as a lot of what I'm going to be posting on natural selections. Um, but it serves both as uh, the response to that um, misinformation filled uh, article that was published by Berlinski and Deegan in Quillette a few years ago, and also to some degree by the um, a response to the Sam Harris and Eric, Eric Topol podcast that uh, we talked about last week, which largely, I, you know, they there weren't a lot of errors introduced by them that I think they didn't pick up from the Quillette article. Um, so um, this in in this piece, it is it is not the original draft was really a sort of a, a rebuttal, but we decided, you know what, this is this is not what we should be doing. This is not what anyone should be doing. What we should be doing is laying out what we see as the evidence, what we see as where evidence is missing, where we need more, why we need clarifications, so that all of us can actually remember that we are on the same team, on the same planet, and that we need to have policies that actually serve all of us maximally so far as that is possible. And so what we lay out here um, are really, um, I guess, six, you know, six different sort of organizational frameworks, uh, organizational topics. Uh, we explain why, why it is that we've landed where we have by going through the evidence for um, the effectiveness as, of ivermectin as prophylaxis against COVID, the safety record of ivermectin, the safety record of the novel coronavirus vaccines and the effectiveness of the novel coronavirus vaccines. We then talk some about natural immunity um, and why people with natural immunity um, are not being considered in the discussion. Rather, we have being presented by the media, for instance, with these, with this simplistic and frankly absurd dichotomy of vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And we speak some to the politicization of, of the discussion and um, just a little bit more on some of the some of the many errors that are in um, that are in some of the pieces that have been produced as if they are good faith criticisms. And you know, as we as we have said many times, um, you know, we we need, we want, everyone should need and want good faith criticism. But at the point that your critics are making false claims about what it is that you yourselves have said or done or believe, um, that should tell you more about the critics than it tells you about you. So yes, it's one of it's one of two things that I find particularly disturbing about the critics is um, having to portray us as believing things and having said things that we didn't believe or don't believe and didn't say mm -hmm. um, is obviously evidence of something and we can talk about what it's evidence of but it's clearly you know, uh, having to defend against straw man attacks is obviously uh, crazy making but there's also this question about um, the implications, right? What we are being held responsible for, I find uh, particularly onerous and uh, destructive. So in essence, you will find many people saying, well, you know, lives are at stake. And what you're saying on your podcast is going to result in the death of people. And this is, um, on the one hand, as we ourselves have said before anyone else said it about us, obviously there are lives at stake and so we take this very seriously on the other hand it is cheating to hold us responsible for this the correct honorable way to do this is to recognize that lives are at stake in the public health policy questions and your personal health decisions with respect to how you choose to protect yourself from covid that is true what that means is that a great deal rests on how the evidence is interpreted and it is true, you can certainly protect yourself from the accusation that you will be responsible for other people's um, health consequences and possibly deaths by not saying anything. That's true. You can simply not say anything or you can embrace the conventional wisdom as dispensed by public health authorities. And then who could possibly hold you responsible? On the other hand, you've watched those public health officials fail again and again and again.
and we can talk about why they might be failing. There are at least two reasons on the table. One of them is incompetence, inability to read what is taking place in the world. The other is corruption, which is something that you and I have talked about uh, from the beginning. And both of these things are rendering the advice we are being given publicly feeble. So the question is what to do about it. If you're in a position like we are in, do you talk about what you see or do you keep quiet so as not to be blamed? Right now, my feeling is we are morally required to the extent that we believe we can see something that is failing about the public health analysis. We are morally required to engage in talking about this. You are not required to listen. You are certainly not required to extrapolate from anything that we say on this podcast and adjust your behavior. You can just listen into a discussion. Imagine it's a seminar taking place in which we are talking about whether or not the public health analysis makes any sense. Now, if you find yourself persuaded by something that we say, it may indeed affect your behavior, but that's because you have been persuaded. We don't have the power to dictate any policy. Nobody has to follow what we're saying. Nobody has to listen in. So people are choosing to listen in. They are rightly frightened by the fact that the advice they are getting from public health officials doesn't add up, not even superficially. And so I would just simply ask, it is not the case that we are putting people's lives at risk. It is the case that lives are at stake in the COVID pandemic and that it is true that lives will be lost if we do the wrong things and not the right things. The question is, what are the right things and how would you know? Now, what do you do in a case where you have rampant corruption? And I do think one of the things that is afflicting people's um, comprehension of what's taking place here is that many people who have not been inside academia or conversely are so deeply enmeshed in it that they are dependent on it are incapable of seeing that the same corruption that has rendered our governmental structures so thoroughly broken so that they do the bidding of others instead of the bidding of the public, that same thing is true inside of academia more subtly. It makes its way into papers, it makes its way into analyses, it makes its way into the advice that we get from many people who are involved in that structure, but you can't see it. And if it hasn't been your home, you don't recognize it. So you think, somehow you think, everybody on earth must all be agreed that the right thing to do is to drive SARS-CoV-2 to extinction, or at least manage it really well. And that must be the source of all of this advice. But I'm telling you, that can't possibly be right. It can't be what's generating this advice because in many places that, that uh, advice doesn't add up even superficially. So there are certain questions that I would advise you keep your eye on. Certain things that tell you that something other than public health or private well-being is driving the policy. Why are we argued, why are we told that we should vaccinate those who are naturally immune as a result of having had SARS-CoV-2 already? That doesn't make any sense. We know that the immunity you get from the vaccines is narrower, and we know that it uh, fades. We now know that it fades. Two, why are we treating the young in the same way that we are treating the old with respect to the need to vaccinate? There's obviously a very different cost-benefit ratio. And why are we not using safe tools that appear to have some effectiveness to close the gap left by the vaccines, those the vaccines can't reach, those the vaccines won't reach, those who need treatment because they have a breakthrough case. Why wouldn't we use those things? All right, you wanted to say something. No, you moved on. Um, you, you sure? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I wanted to make a couple of points. The defense that we need is simply that we are trying to do the right thing, right? This is well understood in the law. There are many places where good Samaritans are protected for engaging in behavior intended to help rather than harm, even if harm is done. That is the defense necessary for what we are up to. We do not have some other thing motivating us. In fact, we have paid a very substantial price for speaking out publicly on this topic. And we would ask that you just simply recognize that whether we are right or wrong, we are intending to do good. And we are also interested, as we make very clear in the piece that we published yesterday, we are focused on the long-term well-being of humanity. That means not just the well-being of people who are alive today, but people who will be alive generations from now, who either will have to deal with SARS-CoV-2 continuing to circulate in some 
new form or won't because we've succeeded in driving it to extinction? That's a deep question. We have an obligation to them. They cannot speak for themselves. We have to act on their behalf. But the point is, why would somebody listen to us at all? Well, one reason that they would listen to us is that we have actually seen ahead and that if you listen to us, you were ahead on thinking about masks. You were ahead on thinking about the importance of the volume of the room in terms of uh, infection from uh, COVID. You were ahead in thinking about variants. You were ahead in seeing the narrowness of the immunity that was likely to come from uh, spike protein S1 subunit vaccinations. You were ahead in recognizing the outdoor environment as safe and someplace that you should go. You were ahead in recognizing the importance of vitamin D. You were ahead with respect to the lab leak hypothesis. You were ahead with respect to the massive significance of comorbidities. That's not even a complete list. That's just a bunch of places where if you were watching us, you were paying attention to these things really early at the very least. And so I will just finish this by saying, for some reason, when we talk about things like foreign policy, we have a term for war profiteers, right? War profiteers. War profiteers. Yes. Nobody gets all bent out of shape. They don't accuse you of conspiracy theorizing if you say there are war profiteers and we need to beware that they may have an effect on our foreign policy that could push us into wars that we would be better off staying out of. Everybody gets that even when there are lives at stake in the context of war, that there are people whose perverse incentives might cause them to mislead us. Why do we not understand that that same thing is at least plausible with respect to a pandemic. Are there pandemic profiteers? If so, what might they have us do that we shouldn't do? This is something we need to ask ourselves. And our ability to predict things is something you could judge us on, but you at least need to recognize that we are in a landscape where potentially people have perverse incentives that might lead us to do things that will result in, um, in deaths that don't need to occur. If I can just restate in a sentence what you just said, profiteer is a general category, uh, and war profiteer is a subcategory that is well understood uh, to be uh, to, to be out there, regardless of whether or not you believe that you know incident X or Y was an example of it. Uh, war profiteering is a subcategory of profiteering, and so what you're saying is um, that there are of course other types of profiteering, and pandemic profiteering is likely to be one of them. Right. It's likely to be one of them. And frankly, it's not a very big leap from what we've seen mm -hmm. from the pharmaceutical industry in other contexts. We know that very often we see advice. We know that it makes it into the academic literature and then is only later revealed to be harming people. So come on, what part of this is shocking, right? The question is, how much of an effect is it having on the public health advice that we are getting? And one thing to pay attention to is the public health advice doesn't make sense, right? I'm not saying none of it makes sense, but a lot of it doesn't make sense, even on its face. Why are we vaccinating people who've had COVID? That's a question I've not heard a good answer to. And the CDC's answer, you can look it up, doesn't make any sense. Why is that? Is that ineptitude or is it corruption, right? Could be either, could be both. But at some level, it's a question that needs an answer. And until it has an answer, there's, a, there's some issue about how bad is that rot? Whatever rot it is that resulted in us putting people in harm's way, giving them a vaccine we don't know very much about with respect to the safety when they don't get a benefit from it, why would we do that? Well, we could we could prevent them from taking that risk. And the fact that we don't raises a question, how bad is the rot? How far does it go? And one indication is if others outside of that apparatus are predicting things about the pandemic better than that apparatus does, then that is a reason for alarm.